So why don't we start? So welcome to our sixth episode, our uh, June episode. Um, we've had a very dramatic development over the last month. Um, hopefully some of you were able to visit as it was uh, being installed. Uh, and we thought uh, we'd, we'd show Xu Kong's um, uh, time lapse, uh, about two days worth of action in a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I hope you don't get dizzy. Oh. <laughs> and um, I thought we'd, um, use this opportunity tonight to um, to recap. It's We've had six, well, this will be our sixth episode. And since we haven't done this before, many of us, we've learned a lot <clears throat> over the last six months. And I feel like, oh, this is a, a good opportunity to um, sort of do a best of and, and to recap um, the things that we've learned and to, to let that settle in a little more. So we're going to start with um, Perseida. She's going to show a couple of photographs of the before um, of Linda's yard. And then um, Shukha is going to show his uh, time lapse. And then Perseida is going to show a photograph of what it is now. And, um, and in the process of um, installing Linda's yard, a lot of questions came up about the, the process and about what's, what's native plants and, and things like that. And so I think uh, Perseida will recap a lot of what she's been talking about over um, since the beginning of the year. Um, and then it, we can uh, have a discussion about that. And depending on how that goes, um, we also have a, a couple of other segments uh, if we have time for that. Uh, Linda and Carol will be talking about um, a recap of a foundational element of our, our uh, program on the soil. And then Linda will be talking about things that we may be we will be um, uh, having an episode in the future uh, on health and how all of this is effect, effect, affecting our health. Um, so either if we have time, we can get into a discussion about that or, or it can just be a preview of a future uh, episode. So um, why don't we get started? Priscilla, are you ready? I think so. I'm sharing my screen. You should be seeing, not my text, you should be seeing, do you see? Yes, what do you see? Your PowerPoint. Okay, great. And do you also see the thumbnails on the side? Yep. Yeah. I should make it smaller. So this is, this is the back 60. This is a 60 by 60 square, which is the back, but actually on the side of Linda's house um, facing Parker, the front of the house faces Woodside. Uh, and this was what it looked like. Some demo had already been done here, Linda, right? Well, Plants had already been pulled out or is this just the winter, the post winter look? Um, I, this might not be the, the this might be after uh, the base were the removed. It looks a little bit like that. So, right, there were, so there were several steps and this is after a lot of um, non-native stuff had been removed from the sides here. You can see that the old vegetable bed was still in place and some, an old fire pit and so on. This is looking from the second floor of Linda's house out to the back 60. The next thing that happened was there was a stone wall put in, which is rather spectacular in a very quiet New England way. And there was leveling and the soil was, um, loam was placed, the soil was amended throughout the yard. A soil analysis had been done and some good loam topsoil and compost was spread around here. This is a pile of soil that went out. Here you can see that the beds, the raised beds already exist. 
This is a bunch of chipped wood from the trees that were taken out. It And there's a hole here in the fence where this machine came in, a little bitty cat, and was running around and flattening things out. And then much planting happened, and this is where Xu Kong gets to show his one and a half minutes of three days of work. Shu, are you ready? I'll stop sharing. Yes, hold on. Uh, right here, pick the video and off we go. A lot of leveling and pushing around. There's no sound, so you can. That was a big maple that just went in. It's going in. Yeah, the big Japanese maple in the far right corner behind the wall. What is the one in front of the maple? So this little yellow thing dead center or the one to the left? Dead center, yeah, the yellow thing. That's beautiful. That's a small Japanese maple. You see that this large evergreen just got placed. That's giving privacy to this yard from the house next door and from to the house next door from this yard. It was very bright those days. Or rainy. We had a mix. Almost more than the eye can process, isn't it? Spreading of loam. Right. Ta-da, okay. What was it? I'll go back and share my screen and show you. So this, this is the finished finished. This is where it is at the moment. It is not done. Uh, this is the evergreen you saw being placed. This is the big red Japanese maple that had to be brought in with the, the um, little cat. This is a nook with hollies and a couple of native viburnum in the back. There's an alley here, which is all viburnum, fringe tree, and other things that disappears down besides the house that you can't see. Here are native trees around this maple that stayed and there's a native plum prune there that stayed. This is a cherry, this is a peach, more beds inside the yard to complement the ones outside the yard. And there will be a fire pit here. There's gonna be a lot more shrub planting. This is where the gate will be. This gate will be closed. There will be more particularly shrubs and low growing um, creeper type things and some lawn that's gonna be put in, hasn't been put in yet coming in here. On the front of the house, the side of the house, there were some plants um, set aside for the, to, to remove all of these non-natives. These all got yanked out. You can see the stone bench here for perspective. And those non-natives were replaced with viburnum, rhododendrons, again, fruit trees, a couple of different fruit trees and some elderberries. So this should be year-round privacy from these rhododendrons and then some fruits for the people and birds um, and for fragrance. There's a couple of things in here for fragrance. So that's kind of where the yard is at at the moment. 50 woody plants, 26 species, seven are non-native, but all the rest are native or pretty close to native, give high ecosystem function. There's been a lot of conversation about what's native and what that means and how to gauge what the benefits are to the environment. So we thought that it would be worth having a conversation specifically about that. I'll set us up and then you can tell me what you would most like me to do. I can go through my rationale for each of the woody of the trees that was planted. Um, but we can spend a little bit of time thinking about what native is and why it's important broadly. And that might help us think about why we chose these in particular. So by native, we really mean something that comes from this place in this time, this latitude, this altitude. 
And the reason that that's so important is that 90% of insect species are host plant specialist, which means that they have for different life stages, a specific species, which is their much preferred host, the one on which they can be the most successful. And why that is, is because plants have a lot of defenses against insects, right? Because otherwise they would be eaten down to nothing. And the, the specialist insects have developed metabolism and ways of processing those chemical defenses of the trees. So if you give them a different tree, all their um, getting around the defenses isn't gonna work anymore. It's really about having this combination of the host species and the insect that can feed on that host species. As early as the 1830s, von Humboldt said, nature is not a collection of species, it is a web of interconnected interacting species. And given all the research that has been done on our losses of insects in particular, but also of plants, people are now talking about the extinction of the interactions of these specialized pairs as being more important than the extinction of species. Because when you lose one species, what you lose is all these interactions. So lepidopterans in particular have been used as a measure, a metric for what is native and how well it will succeed or how good a plant is in a given environment. And I know I said some of this before, don't worry about having a lot of caterpillars, which are the one of the early stages of the, the stage before the butterfly <coughs> stage or the stage before the moth stage. Most of them develop underground, so you won't be overrun with caterpillars. And when you have caterpillars, birds eat caterpillars. You want to keep a soft soil with a leaf litter cover, not with a bark mulch cover, because when those caterpillars drop down, they need to borrow into that mulch and a bark mulch isn't going to do it for them in most places. So using these as a metric, I know I showed this slide before, it's kind of a very, it's a terrific condensation of top 10. If you don't know what to plant, if you start with this list, and go for local versions of these groups of trees or woody plants, you're gonna be in very good shape. So I can tell you which of these we put into the yard, into Linda's yard, whoops, sorry. Um, oaks, obviously oaks tend to be quite huge, majestic and they would take over. We used a small mid-Atlantic oak that does very well here that isn't gonna get that big. In maybe 40 years, it might be 35 feet, might be. So it gives you a lot of time and it's gonna give you a lot of good habitat. Plums, the wild plums, we have one wild plum, we have a couple of peaches and another plum. Some of these decisions were not made on really ecological grounds as much as an availability issue. The commercial horticultural landscape is not yet set up for a high demand of native species. And you have to kind of go with what you want, with, what you, with what's available combined with what you really want. Um, the little oak that I planted came from Nebraska because I couldn't find anybody closer than that who was carrying smaller oaks. So if you're, I'm torn between sort of telling you how would be the ideal way to do it and not wanting to discourage you. You know, if you start the fall before you want to plant stuff, you can start pulling things together. But if you're doing it more spontaneously as we were doing here, you kind of go back and forth between what's available and what's going to give best ecosystem value. So willows, there are native willows, there's native birches. Neither of those was useful in this yard because the yard wasn't wet enough. And you wanna to try to plant with your conditions, not against your conditions, because otherwise you'll spend all your time fighting. And the idea is not to fight, it's to integrate with what's there. Tulip poplars, um, we didn't put in because they tend to get quite large, they're gorgeous. It has wide roots and you might not wanna put it right next to a house. We went with apple. Some people have issues with apple because they're quote, um, dominant, they'll take over. 
if you plant something like that in a suburb, there's so much pavement around, the chance of it actually taking over is really trivial. And it gives really good um, wildlife value as well as people value. So it was well worth putting in a couple of apples. Um, they're also very good pollinator plants when they're in bloom. Uh, maples, we don't have any maples, big maples per se, but box elder, wait, there's a maple on the site that was there before. Yeah, I take it back. Vaccinium, the cranberries and the blueberries, planted a bunch of those. Uh, those are terrific, both for birds and for uh, invertebrates, for moths and butterflies. A couple of hazelnuts. And again, I had to go out of state to get hazelnuts. I went on Etsy to get hazelnuts. You can get pretty much anything on Etsy, really and truly. So that was kind of the reasoning. Now there's more things we can go back and talk about if you're interested, um, other stuff, go back through the list of things that are in the yard and why we chose them. These are things that are still to come. Um, the short two to six foot layer is a very fun layer to fill in because they're smaller, they're easier to move around, <laughs> you don't take as much care, and you don't need a professional to help you put them in. So we have a couple of slides, we have a couple of images from Ivan's garden where he shows what he did, we can do that, um, and then go back to a conversation from you, questions that you have, or things that you'd like to talk about on Linda's yard. Shall we do that? Ivan, do you wanna talk about your Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, all of these ideas sort of came after attending a few of these meetings. So on, on the right, um, on the right side of the of the slide, you see the two raised garden beds. I went to Etsy. I, you know, I'm not handy. I just bought uh, two cedar beds, three by six, two of them, and look at how well the the, the, the vegetables are doing. It's just fantastic. And then I was happened to be listening to Priscilla and she was talking about native pollinators and she had these seeds and I was like, you know, I want to get rid of my lawn. So I start, I, and I wasn't sure where to start, right? So I just said, let me take patches. And I chose uh, four patches or three patches on either side. Priscilla, I went this evening right into the garden and you can't believe over the last two days how much they've grown. But they are just phenomenal. And I have a list here of all of the uh, um, seeds that uh, Prasada gave. There are about 20 different seeds in this little patch here. And I'm not sure what's going to take off. But there's, oh. my God, there's Coreopsis, there's Indian blanket, there's butterfly milkweed. I just can go on and on, but there's 20 of them. So it's anticipation. I put it on my website. And everyone's like, oh, can you keep on taking photographs and show how, how it changes over time? So thank you very much, Prasada. It's this anticipation. I have no idea what's going to show up. And, it's, and it, I, it looks fantastic. And you can see we sit out there and have our coffee. And it's just going to be fabulous. So Wonderful. thank you. Oh, my gosh. And I love that you put it right in the middle. I like a person who starts in the middle. Right plonk in the middle. <laughs> you know, it's going to take over the whole place a whole lawn after some time so anyway so thank you wow yeah spectacular really yeah. spectacular well done well done yeah. you i'll take a few more photographs in a couple of weeks hopefully the flowers will be popping out by then yeah the heat was very good the heat and sun for those things is was quite well oh my god Priscilla! yes a couple of days ago there were like when i sent you the photographs there were like you know little things but today I was just watering the garden a few minutes ago. It's, it's just like, wow. So it's so cool. So it, how, some of these are going to get quite tall. So you won't be able, you wouldn't be able to walk on them. You could walk through them, but you could make, you could expand the area in which you planted them and have paths around as opposed to have a lot of yard around. Yes, 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 yes. You want to have, I mean, you want to be able to move around. And I see you have vegetables here as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I posted on my website all the vegetables that Sheila picked up yesterday. And there was chard and spinach and kale. 
I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm excited because the first time I'm doing this, so sorry about no. that. But really, really amazing. Where did you source? Where did you source your chard and your spinach and your kale? Did you start from seed? Oh, you... by the way, somebody. I think it was somebody on this uh, spoke about Rightlock Farm, and they said just order your your uh, seedlings early. And I just ordered everything from Rightlock Farms. <laughs> they had it already. Just drove up there, and and by the way, the, these beds are. How do you say? Who, 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 uh, Hugel culture. How do you say that again? Hugel culture. Hugel culture. Good yes, there's there's actually logs in the bottom, and there's like rich, rich, uh, rich soil, compost, and oh, it's just and the plants love it. So it's perfect. It is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, we have pictures of the layering making the Hugel cultures when we did it on the ones in my yard, and uh, that might be nice to add at some point to show exactly how it was layered in. And I liked your idea, Linda, of having a glass pane. In fact, mm. at some point, I would love to have a glass pane in front to see how that changes, you know? Yeah, but, I was debating glass versus plexiglass. See-through. Oh, plex yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. maybe plexiglass. No, well, I mean, I, I maybe said glass, I thought of that. And then I kind of, you know, you, you think it one way and the other before you do it. But yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see how it evolves over time. Yes. Um, and the... Uh, um, yeah, it's wonder. It's just wonderful. Are there more seeds left? I know at one point you were trying to get rid of them. Are they done, Perseida? No, not at all. I still have seeds. And your grass seed, I asked you if you wanted to share that grass seed out. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having some more of it myself, but um, I would be happy to share out and I'd be happy to get some of these other seeds. I, I love the idea of watching them grow over time. They don't have to fit the yeah, I, mean, I think this is terrific, I, Ivan. It's I think your notes colorful. said annuals and perennials, so it's it's an interesting mix, you know. So yeah, and they will seed themselves, and they will also, of course, seed outside of this beautiful raised bed you have given them, and they might um, start to spread themselves into your lawn. So you need to know whether you're okay with that. I'm sure if you mow over them, they won't take over, but think about whether they're gonna save you work in the future or whether you, which way you wanna go with it. And you might wanna just see what yeah. happens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I didn't think of that. Yeah, but you're right. So it might just spread, but, which may be a exactly. good thing, so. I will say yeah. that people yeah. sometimes are disappointed. Um, there's a couple of things, expectations that it's worth keeping in mind. They are not as, soft to walk on as grass. They can also be of different heights, like up to 18 inches probably. So be aware of that in advance. And some people find that they look unkempt. One of the things that I think is nice about Linda's yard is that it shows you can have habitat stuff without it being messy. Some people are not into um, or more informal gardens. They want it to be a little more pulled together. So. Those are things you can think about as it goes and see where you where you sit with that. There are still both pollinator seed plant, um, pollinator plant seeds. I have a lot of those and some grass seed uh, left over from Linda's yard. So if anybody wants any of those, please just put it in the chat or get in touch with me personally. And so, one question you had asked me yeah. last time was the, the germination uh, percentage. You know, I gave you a rough estimate of 80%, but look at this. I mean, just everything took over. So, I mean, I'd say it's almost 100%. <laughs> Which is fantastic. And I want to say that um, Ivan did something that I have found. It may might make it harder to spread the seed around, but it certainly improves the germination, which is I give them 24 hours soak in water, comfortable soak, lots of water, and it has a big effect. You can't, you know, s spread them as easily perhaps as when they're dry and, but I- No, so the trick, work. the trick is a couple yeah. of things. One thing you told me about putting it in the refrigerator. So I put it in the refrigerator for about three weeks, two and a half, three weeks. And then I let them soak overnight. And then you mix it with, um, what did I mix it with? I mix it with, um, with good compost earth, and it's yeah. easier to, uh, with earth. It's, it's easier to spread it that way. Yeah. 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 So brilliant, and then you get that kind of germination, which is pretty spectacular. It is. So about native, non-native, if people have questions, I'm trying to remember what else. Oh yeah, these are other things that are going, gonna go in the demo yard. We already said that. Um, this was the stuff standing around in the driveway before it went in. 
and then yeah there's more but so we were thinking that people would want to ask about talk about native non-native are there questions about that i thought they, I, I did a walk with um boot boatwell in the right lock farm and uh it was just spectacular to have his definition of things like invasives just that they take early and to your point Perseda, about having a match these sort of ecological pairs yeah. and that the in some ways the invasives just are a mismatch and they can they take advantage of the opportunities um and i i think expanding on the definition as opposed to just you know what's local versus non-local in the sense of native to that area is interesting in relation to the characteristics of invasives. So that's a good point. Invasive is used two ways. One in a fairly technical way, meaning that it is a non, it is not genetically from the area. So if it's from Japan, clearly it's non-native. Invasive is however, and it's, it's also, invasive can also be used just to describe a very strong competitive plant that will overrun other things. Even if it comes from that area, it can be, it can take over a lot. The real horror, the real issue is these plants that come from other places because those are ones, they bring all their defenses, which would be not successful in their native habitat against some specialized insect that's used to living on them. But here they come and there's nothing that can get around those defenses. So nothing can feed on them. I will post in the chat and on our website, a, a Vimeo, a, it's either a YouTube or a Vimeo of Doug Tallamy giving a talk on specificity, host plant specificity. He is a now famous entomologist who has specialized in his research career and now in his popular writings on these host plant specializations. And he speaks very eloquently with a lot of data and very accessibly about exactly that issue and talks about all the experiments that have been done bringing in plants that don't belong or just going into a neighborhood. One experiment in particular somebody, this was not an experiment, this was an observation, and then they followed it up with experimentation. Somebody looked at chickadees feeding their offspring and how much time they spend in different trees in their territory in a Washington DC neighborhood. And their territory was maybe a block, a block of houses. And in that territory, they visited 96% of the time they did their foraging in native trees, five different species. And the other 4% of the time were once off visits into non-native ornamentals, which DC is very heavily planted in ornamentals. One visit, nothing there to eat. And they went over to all the, the five native trees. If there aren't enough native trees in a given area, they can't travel far enough to get enough calories to feed their babies and they're not able to raise young. Hey, so, Christina, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I'll, I'll add to that, that not only was it about the foraging moms and dad chickadees, but it was also about how many nests ended up with dead babies in it, which was significant because there aren't enough native trees which support yeah. caterpillars, which feed the babies. So right. that's the real point, right? It's to, to feed the birds. And I think that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. That's why it's important. You know, native plants like poison ivy can be aggressive, unwanted, and invasive, but they're native. We don't want them. But there are non-native plants that are aggressive, to your point, Brisseta, that hurt, actively hurt bird populations, et cetera, et cetera, and our native trees, et cetera, et cetera. And so why the importance of native trees and shrubs is important is because we're focused on the bird population and native bugs, as you've said in many past lectures. And when you remember I showed a food pyramid, I think twice, and the base of the pyramid as it was figured is the plants because the plants bring 
the insects, as we've been talking, and the insects bring all these other things. The birds, as Demetra said. Now we have we have greater knowledge than that, which is we know that the soil actually is what needs to be cared for in order to make the plants grow because each, each level needs to be appropriate in its makeup in order to support the level on top of it, right? If you're building a house, you're not gonna put something really heavy on something really not light. Each level needs to support what's gonna come. And that's a physical analogy. And what we're talking about is ecological process, but you can use that as a way of thinking about the whole thing. Can I just add one thing because um, you had commented, so I get my, I got my compost from the, from the transfer station and God only knows what, what's in that compost because I had these beautiful uh, <laughs> plants that grew. And, um, you know, I, I, I sent a photograph to Prasada and um, she said, um, you know, when they, when they come to seed, uh, put, yank it out. So I actually sent, Prasada photograph. Um, so, was that the mustard? Sorry. Was that the mustard? Yeah, the field mustard. The mustard. Beautiful. Yeah. That beautiful. came out of the compost. It came out of the compost. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Sorry for the. Uh, oops. What's going on? Okay. Yeah. So it was the yeah it was the field mustard, and uh, I got two cameras going. That's why. Do. Um, <laughs> They, are, they, they, they look fantastic. They, mm -hmm. what I, when I researched it, what I found was that they can spread like crazy and you know you get, you get a field of it. So I chose to yank it out yesterday and I sent a photograph Prasada just to show you how, how, how well it grew, but how sad it was to pull it out. And Ivan, it's, it's an interesting question and I'm not sure you're more of a scientist certainly than I am, but it's not entirely to blame it on just a ton of money on compost from Black Earth or whatever and gotten, you know, fabulous compost. And you still would have had a crop of that mustard because of the timing of when you put the compost down. Oh, that's it was, you know, so the mustard is a bumper crop. The good news is it's a biann biennial and you, if you pull it, you get rid of it and it's good pesto. But I guess I'm trying to encourage people watching that the free compost from the transfer station is pretty good. <laughs> oh, no. It's not no. necessarily that it was infested with seed is my point. And I, and I can speak to the quality and because we don't know, but I can speak to the quality of that compost. It is from the lawn clippings, it's, it's our own material. It does not include any street sweeping, so it should have no salts and no street chemicals. Um, and no one is saying that it's organic, what would be legally organic, but it is a pretty high caliber in terms of nutritional value. And because it cooks for a long time, it tends to cook off a lot of its seeds. <laughs> because it sits there, they really age it well. Part of the aging process is the breaking down, including some of the seeds in there, but also the high temperatures, which tend to kill many of the seeds. So you don't get much in the way of contamination. I think it's unknowable whether this actually came from the compost. Um, yeah. I would echo Demetria's point on that. Because I think to Demetria, Demetria's point and your point, I, I put compost everywhere. And this was one single plant that grew. So I, it's impossible to yeah. ascertain that it actually came from, 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 you know, from the transfer station. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, just, uh, just a comment that could have come from the compost station. You know, and that, and that's, that's, but Can I, I guess my point would be more that. Brad, go ahead. It speaks to our need to be pure. Um, there are so many different sources of, of um, amendments. Um, you talk about composted cow manure, and there are plants the cows eat and process the seeds, and it, the seeds, certain seeds, go through the whole digestive system of the cows, comes out the other end as part of the 
composted manure and they sprout in your yard too. It's just, it, it um, yeah, it, the, the, the goal of trying to be 100% of anything is really hard. So some of, the, some of the fun is the competition among species, right? That was exactly the plan of that seed to make it through the digestive tract and get as yeah. far away from where it started and it ends up in Ivan's yard, baby. Well, oh my, I, and it was I a piece of. It's, it's interesting, Fred, because I just heard a post out here where I am and there, there's a big nursery out this way. People buy a lot of mulch. They buy a lot of compost from them. And those jumping worms, have y'all heard about them? They're fun. Perseta yeah. has, they're coming up because they're coming in from parts of Asia and they're in the South and now they're heading up this way and someone has them in her yard because she bought a lot of really great compost that didn't get hot enough to kill the eggs. So jumping worms, woohoo! And these are really bad creatures. They're invasive and they eat too much and blah, blah, blah. So it's impossible to be pure. Right. So it. it so yeah, in fact, I was going to make it what's different the point. Um, it's not just that it's impossible, but that it's sort of not. I'm not sure that's the metaphor that I would subscribe to. My feeling is that it's like life. It's a great metaphor for life, and life is a great metaphor for the garden, which is that you do the best you can, and you work and sweat and plan, and then stuff happens and. I think the spirit of and then you oh, pick wow, up jumping words <laughs> and then you pick up jumping words and you get field mustard and you go well that's a beautiful plant and now I know that it makes good pesto and poor Demetrius having a hard time with jumping words <laughs> but it's it's just it's life I feel like it's part of the richness and here's part of the richness too and she doesn't want me to be talking to you because I haven't been playing with her. It's just part of the richness. And I'm not saying that some things aren't bad because they really are. But it's, you do the best you can and it doesn't go the way you well, necessarily Prisetta, want. I, That's my in point. my yard, I couldn't afford to rip everything out. So even if I wanted to take everything out, right? Depends on the size and the area and how much time and energy and who's doing the work. I look at it as a continuity, you know, just a phasing, you know, What's gonna, what can I do this year? What do it next year? And you know, to well, say- Well, yes. Yeah. And, you, and you make a particularly good point. For those of you who don't know, Anne, she is a very rigorous person in her yard and <laughs> she scrubbed the soil, which is an extraordinary amount of work and makes me feel like a complete, you know, uh, like a Twinkie because I'm going scrub the soil. No, you just plant around. And I watched her, Prasada. I watched her every day, every time she was out there on her knees. What? Oh my God. So for those who don't know, somebody needs to explain what scrubbing the soil is. I have ideas, but they may not be matching mm -hmm. everything that's true. I was going to invite Anne to do it because she spends so many hours, oh. hundreds of hours doing it. I didn't it. realize even you've been watching me, but no, I had a yard and the... Um, Boot and I, I live next to Boot Boutwell. So both of us really just on winter our pond. yards. On winter pond. On winter pond. So we never did chemicals or anything. And we all just really didn't care that much. We concentrated on the wetlands and the backyard. And But this year, um, I hadn't noticed that the grubs had come in really mm -hmm. badly. And last year, I'd done a lot of work on my invasive wetland plants. And in March, all of a sudden, I looked around and the yard was dead. So I had been planning on doing the the garden bed and expanding it but then I also had to do the yard the grass so I had to clear the thatch the dead club grass and then I tilled it removed all the rocks and tilled it and so I was caught in the time warp of do I put in seed or sod and I'd already been spending a lot of money on the plant which I had been planning and all of a sudden I had this other big expense yep. and then I think I think what really happened is the person I was working with couldn't source the sod in time or where he was getting it from Rhode Island. And so we went, I went with seed and I bought the eco seed from Prairie Moon. So it kind of is a long, I don't know, Demeter, if you know that grass, it, it grows longer and it's a drought tolerant grass. So you don't have to cut, it's called like no mow if you don't want to mow it. And one Demetri uses. Yeah, oh, that's, okay. 
that's if I'm going to grow grass like that, I use that low mow. I get it from American Meadows, but I'm sure it's the same it's thing. Probably the same thing, right? And yep. so I was up against the window of hot temperatures, you know, and uh, so what's happened is so, so I got the grass in. And then a week, 10 days later, I really had to start weeding because my yard had all these seeds and it didn't, I didn't get compost that was cooked or, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't sure what to do. So do you put it all in your compost? Did I, you put, you know, so you, you kind of go with what you have to figure out. I hadn't planned it enough in advance to maybe figure out all the steps, but it's coming in. I did weed it another couple of weeks on your knees <laughs> and then I reseeded it and I'm trying to really water it. Um, I, filled in some areas that are not coming in, but I was really struggling with how much yard, how much plants. Um, I have a very large backyard, so I don't really have much yard except in the front. And so you worked with a company called Patera. I happened to look correct. up. Yeah, they're fantastic. Oh my God. Right. So they're doing a lot of our wetlands restoration work. And we have them working on the Aberjona for the downtown. And I've been introducing them to folks on Winter Pond because it's really hard to know exactly what to do. And it's actually really hard work to, to be because of, it's rocky and it's steep and, and uh, many of the homeowners are actually elderly. So we're trying to figure out how to control the invasives around um, Winter Pond to be really dangerous to the, to the health of the pond. But I wanted to go back to what Priscilla was saying and, and ask just a question or two. I know I use the word Demetra for I was, I, when I've taken a lot of classes at New England Wildfire Society, now the Native Plant Trust, and they encourage you to use uh, for not for native plants like um, you know catalpa trees or poison ivy to use aggressive or enthusiastic plants, uh -huh. separated from being invasive. So I always talk when I talk about an aggressive plant or enthusiastic plant, I'm usually talking about like poison ivy, and, and I also look, come to learn because I helped uh, the Right Lock Farm. There's actually some good to have some poison ivy. It's a wonderful feeder for, for birds. Exactly. I mean, it's a great it's beautiful plant. in the winter. In the fall, it's just gorgeous color, you know. Right. So it, it really depends on where you don't really don't want in your backyard. But right. some of the wild areas we have, on, we can, if you can manage it. But I've also, I've been learning that it's that slight uptick of temperature that's really made the poison ivy take off. And, and that's carbon. Interesting. And the carbon, it loves it all of the carbon. release of carbon. So it is thriving wow. during climate change. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what's scary, I think. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And then um, I it serves like us problem. right. What's it? I said it serves us right. Yeah, yeah, it serves us right. And that's why I see something like a catalpa tree or buckthorn that's growing in the shorelines of the wetlands they're adapting, you know, to this kind of wet moisture. And that's really scary too, you know, because right. it really should only be an upland plant, right? So, and oh, that, I'm sorry, know, I just have a quick question. Are it, catalpa yeah. trees considered as bad as European buckthorn? Well, catalpa trees are native. So they're, why they're are you trees. likening, oh, oh, you're likening catalpa with poison ivy. Right, okay. because they're growing Good. when they when they they're come adapted. along the shoreline, they're just taking over. Next thing you know, you have a hundred catalpas, and, and they're they making the pond into the dry land. Yeah. But European buckthorn yeah. is yeah. is a worthy adversary, but we've got to get it out. Okay, we have to get it out. That's correct. Yes. Right, right. But I wanted to ask you guys, Lexington is protecting their Norway maple. So I thought, Prasetta, you could. How do you look at? They're saying it's habitat. So they, if you look on their if you look on their the website, they have a tree. Their tree policy is really amazing. Lexington, this? Mass has a very extensive tree policy, right? And they're protect right. now protecting the, the Norway maple. They're not. They're saying that you know, it's so much habitat in town that if everybody cut it down, they would lose all that habitat. But you're not feeding anything. That's right. It's so ridiculous. this is a question. They're not defining. So they're defining habitat in a very narrow way, which is they're saying that if a bird makes a nest in it, that's habitat. Uh, I just posted Doug, Tell Doug Tellamy's talk. Um, he talks specifically about Norway maples. He says they're in and of themselves, an individual Norway maple is not the end of the world, but they have two problems. One is that they don't feed much here. And the second is that they spread 
incredibly enthusiastically so that it is a delusion to say we'll just keep these this Norway maple or these Norway maples if you have some Norway maples you will have many Norway maples and the same is true for Euonymus burning bush I have been inspired myself by this work I was I was sourcing so many plants for Linda and running into all these desirable plants and thinking I don't have room to shoehorn this into my yard anymore and then I thought wait a second you still have those huge burning bush do. plants. <laughs> and I know why I have them because they're trunks of the yeah. size of my thighs and I don't have any equipment to get rid of those and it's a complete pain. But I've taken out two plants that are enormous and that too, they're not dropping a lot of seedlings here but birds they eat do. the seeds, carry and them they, somewhere right. else. And like buckthorn, the and they, I, they like buckthorn causes the birds to have diarrhea. Right. So that's, and I think more, right? So, and that's what really gets them to travel. But So can I go back to something you said, Anne? Cause I think we're gonna run out of time. I know there's other things planned for this evening. I wanted to stress personal preference in this. I have lost patches of lawn. I've had lots of caterpillar of um, uh, grubs that eat the roots of the grass, which is why the grass dies. And I don't, dig it up and I don't do anything with them. I hope very fervently that the skunk and opossum and raccoon population will be supported by these grubs. And it used to be the case. And if you're one of those people who's lucky enough to still have them in the yard, you'll have these wonderful divots taken out of your yard. Each one of represents a happy skunk eating a grub because I, and they're gonna grow into beetles and we need those beetles. So I don't dig up any of that stuff. I really try to do the most. But you have a really green lawn. My, mine was literally dead. I could show you all pictures and I was really shocked. And I'm not doubting I, that. And, and yeah. I'm not picking on you in any way. Right. And so I don't, it wasn't a matter of, I could keep a little bit. I think what we've been doing for years is we have been keeping a little bit and it reached a tipping point. And it may be more than the grubs that killed the lawn. It could have been a host of other I, I awesome. want to add just another I, point of view, because yes. I hear what Perseida is saying. I used to have chickens. Chickens love grubs. <laughs> and I had skunks and blah, blah. But you can also get milky spore. So now, Anne, that you've done all this hard work and you're putting in low mo and maybe some clover, whatever you're doing, you can get milky spore and do that and there won't be grubs because they eat grubs and they're a teeny tiny you can't see them microscopic organism thing and i don't quite know how it works but it does and you can find it on <laughs> gardens alive and other sources you know, like i missed that. what you said you talk about nematodes yeah yeah that's what i'm i'm gonna use i've tried i sprayed oh, perfect. i sprayed again yeah but yeah, i also yeah. have my so soil that'll help. so if anybody hasn't had their soil tested i highly recommend you doing it. i did it with umass amherst and unfortunately everybody in Massachusetts was doing it this spring. So it took over two months and I had to get going. So now I've got the results and I'm wondering, what do I do? So I have terrible soil. And that's probably also why the grass died. Yes. So before, another before, whole discussion of how to use. I definitely use the nematodes. And that's, I mean, the cool thing with that is that they're literally part of all those pictures with the soil food web they're one of the main characters in it. So you're adding a good character back into your soil. Yeah. 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 So uh, before we move on, uh, Amanda has a question in the chat. Go ahead. What is it? Fred, can you read uh, it? Amanda, you want to ask it? Um, so my question was uh, going back to the compost. Hi. Um, so I understand the high temperature is destroying the seeds and stuff, but I was curious if you know kind of like the life of pesticides and herbicides that people might be using on their lawns and if that's something that is also. That's a good question. Um, it depends a little bit on how hot it is in the incubator, the anaerobic digester things that people are using. It pretty much denatures. It denatures a lot of the chemicals uh, for the pavement temperature, the, what we're running here, I don't know what chemicals it does and doesn't, but I'm glad you asked that right now because tomorrow I'm talking to a compost specialist and I will ask that question. Carol might know it. Um, I guess I would say that by the time it goes from the grass clippings through the year, one to three years that it's sitting around as compost, 
I think a lot, a lot, a lot of the stuff will have degraded. I, and to tell you, I don't discriminate against that stuff at all. I would use, I use that wholesale and I don't think about the chemicals in it because I feel like it's just not going to be an issue. Amanda, um, it's more like about time than heat, interestingly. Black earth compost pickup specifically uh, requires that if there's going to be grass clippings that they pick up, that it's certified organic. And in part, it's because they know that they're getting inadvertently some grass clippings with chemicals and people just regularly throw toss them like they're regular. So it's one of those examples of biodiversity and dosage. So they're trying to control the amount because they can, they can handle some of it and, um, yeah. but not too much of it. Carol? What company did you just say does that? Black Earth. Black Earth Compost. They specifically on their um, on their requirements. Their flyer. Their, flyer, their two page flyer on what they take and what they don't take. They say we we um, you could separate out grass clippings, um, but we, it has to be certified organic lawn care. Interesting. That's good to know because I'm on Black Earth and I didn't know they even took black grass clippings. Not that I have grass clippings <laughs> since I no longer mow my well, lawn. It's kind of sad what they have to put. They have to put things like, no, we don't take milk cartons. And I'm like, oh my gosh, come on, people. <laughs> right, because it's wax and all that crap. Amanda, I've been using that stuff, but I think, Priseda, I would love to know that too. So whatever you find out, yep. can you make sure it gets shared? Because... I've always thought it's a time thing more than a heat thing. Heat can kill, please God, jumping worms and weed seeds. It's both. Actually, it, sorry, it's both. It's consistency. It has to stay at a high temperature. Okay. So in theory, a commercial, you know, but maybe if jumping worms exist, then maybe they don't quite get all the other stuff. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm curious. Maybe Winchester has a lower percentage of lawns that are all chemical. What? <laughs> that was funny. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think the question might be more about whether the lawn clipping services unload here or somewhere else. We have a lot, whether the lawn care services, we have a lot of people who don't do their own lawns who use a, a service. So I think that it depends a lot on who your service is and what they do. Um, but actually, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, most municipal um, compost centers won't allow commercial dumping. So it's my understanding that if you're a commercial mow and blow guy in Winchester, you're dumping at, you know, Landscape Express. I don't think so. I think that we, we have a very strong um, practice of commercial haulers using the transfer station I would be surprised if we, I would be surprised, it doesn't mean it isn't true, uh, huh. if we didn't also let lawn care services. Now that, you, now that I say that, I don't know that I've seen any, no. I've seen one or two, but I haven't seen them. I don't know, I'll find out. Yeah, find out, because I have a feeling they don't. Which would be interesting and that would get, I think that would tend towards that the, the grass would be cleaner than otherwise, chemically cleaner than otherwise. Well, but homeowners use a ton of chemicals, et cetera. So, but yeah. It's more of a mix, uh, homeowners, than it is maybe lawn care. Yeah, I, don't know. I think so too. Anything else? Other questions, comments? Put rabbits in the chat that plan your rabbits ahead before you plant. Figure out what they eat and don't like and make sure you you know, so you're not disappointed when they munch it down and- eat Rabbits it. eat everything. Yeah. They've They're been dogs. eating my epimediums. I bought a ton yes. of epimediums. And so what I, what I discovered on Amazon, you can get these little cages mm -hmm. and you can ah. just plop them, plop them around your plant and yeah. they work fantastic. Yeah. So my but epimediums are all doing well. Someone's <laughs> eating my pansies. Who would yes. eat my pansies? Rabbit? Of course. 
Every time I get flowers, they're gone the next morning. Right. So, okay. Margo, for what it's worth, we can eat pansy flowers. We just like to dip them in sugar. But a rabbit's like, I don't need the sugar. You know, rabbits will eat everything, and it's a horror. Ivan is right. you got to use fencing. I found all this rabbit scram crap to be. Uh, they laugh at me. Right. Wait, is, it, is it crap? Is it crap? Because I've been buying that stuff and it's sort oh, of deterring just, the rabbits. It, does it work? Which I, one? I, I, you know, I actually tried it, Demetria, and it, uh, I, I have to swear that it works. Okay. Well, you so, know, it, it, it's a matter of how abundant other food sources are. If, yeah, exactly. if there's a scarcity of food, then they'll eat it. Good point. Put yeah. clover in your lawn and maybe, just maybe, they'll eat the clover. Yeah. Yes. Maybe. Exactly. Maybe. Maybe they'll have more babies <laughs> and then they'll eat more of your plants. Well, and maybe if we, well, clover is also an end, an, an endocrine disruptor. So it yeah. might actually- And then they won't have as many babies. That's right. <laughs> I am planting even more clover. Oh my. It's- no, it's 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 very well known for in sheep farming, for example. It's a complete disaster to have clover in your sheep meadow because it completely screws. I personally, not that this is about me, can't drink clover tea without having endocrine disrupting. So I take the false this thing we were saying about toast plant specificity. There are animals that can deal with the false estrogens in plants and there are plenty of animals who can. Sheep cannot deal with them despite all their stomachs and despite their extreme. And so I'm not sure about rabbits, but it would be quite I think rabbits if can. Could... <laughs> <laughs> I think and they can deal with them or handle <laughs> anything. I think it, it doesn't was... slow them down at all. It's a little but faster. it is interesting to think about having some plants that are meant to be easier and they're attractor and have your vegetable garden or whatever, you know, nearby with something that pulls the rabbits over. I mean, is that, is that real? Yeah, that's yeah. real. So, it's, so it's, is... a number, it's a ratio problem. It's a ratio right. problem. And the other thing I will say, I have to put in a pitch for coyotes. If we continue Amen, cutting down 16 acres, 16 acres in the Vale, 10 acres for soccer, 12 acres for the golf course. We're not going to, we no longer have a green a corridor, a green corridor for wildlife, and we no longer practically have any coyotes. And if you don't want rabbits, you should encourage the maintenance of habitat that would allow coyotes. When we had coyotes 250 feet from, there was a nest, a den, 250 feet from my house, we started, we had bunnies everywhere. I mean, you could get a series of bunnies in every size from ridiculously cute to not even remotely cute. And over a couple of weeks, they disappeared. And I was super careful with my cats. But then the missing cat signs went up because they switched over to whatever prey was available. Okay, you need to keep your cats in if you don't want to take that risk. But we had no bunnies for two years. It was pretty terrific. Now we're run overrunning bunnies again because we haven't seen coyotes to speak of since several years ago. So you can't have everything and you gotta make right. choices. And if anybody hasn't seen The Biggest Little Farm, this speaks to so many points in that movie. I highly recommend it. That would be fun to talk about it. some really point. good. Yeah. I rewatched it recently. Yeah, it's really yeah. quite special. It's very inspiring too. This. Hey everybody, and creative. I'm going to say good night. You know, I'm going to go get my yes. girl, but thank you for thank another you. good conversation. Bye. Thank Likewise. Thanks for joining. So um, why don't we switch to um, the other part of the, the presentation? Okay. Um, so uh, actually last night, um, Carol and I and, and Linda met to discuss what we were gonna talk about uh, tonight. And uh, we um, um, sort of changed things around. And, and I realized part of it is in reaction to what is going on right now. Uh, the second heat wave in June 
um, of three or more days of 90 degrees. And it's not going to be that long. In a few years, we're going to have maybe a third of the summer like this, you know, a month full of 90 degrees or higher weather. Um, and it's very disruptive. And uh, we had a hand in this. And uh, part of our conversation last night was um, the difference between what we humans outside of the natural cycles of nature have been trying to create and it's been imperfect. And um, on coming to understand how complete and regenerative the natural cycles are. And part of that understanding for me has been how this is how most indigenous cultures have been living. Um, and we just talked about um, Biggest Little Farm and there are uh, indigenous organizations that are doing similar work out in um, the middle of, in Nebraska and places like that. And this is, uh, I'm not sure if I can, uh, I found this as part of some of their um, like guide, guiding principles. Um, if you wanna read quickly through it. Uh, and part of this is, well, So this is their um, take on um, I can't do this. Oh. This is their process of uh, extracting ourselves from the way we've been living and the way we've been um, creating this mess that we're living in now. And so part, uh, a part of the foundation of Grow Local is to try to become more aware of, of returning to this style of living and living. And we're slowly learning about that through the different components that are important in this cycle. Um, and Carol has been talking about the soil component. And, um, and so that's going to be a, a recap of what Carol's been talking about um, the last few months. And then Linda is going to talk about um, how all these different systems and all the different levels of systems are, are, are like fractals. They, they all reflect each other at each, at each level. And Carol and Linda's specialty is um, our health and how uh, we treat our gardens, how we treat the earth is reflective of how we're treating our bodies. So, uh, Carol, do you wanna give us start it off? Uh, sure. So basically, as we know, we've heard our soil is sick and broken, but we can fix it. It's very exciting what they've discovered. Uh, and they basically, a lot of soil scientists realize that they've discovered 
um, well, they rediscovered, as he mentioned, in regards to the indigenous always knew. And they, that's one of the things they discovered going around the, the world. And the healthiest soils happened to be managed primarily by the indigenous that were really paying attention to all the details. And the key here is when we um, restore our earth, it's from, in part, the healthy soil, which will be help with the healthy plants, healthy humans, animals, insects, and then healthy earth. And along the way, uh, the UN has woken up and they, they've declared this, the ecos this decade, the ecosystem restoration. So as we can see, this is basically what has happened is they were so oversimplifying and trying to make things done fast so that you have it, instead of these perennials that stay for a long time and, and nurture the soil with their really deep roots and just really make the soil erosion drastically less. Um, it's just awful. And as this statement says, nature doesn't contribute to the well-being. It's the life support system of the planet, ecosystem services. And the context of um, native is extremely um, a, a preference. So um, hopefully they were, I've seen some indication that they are making sure to not like plant the same tree all around the world. There, uh, there's enough experts to help with the uh, implementing the native. And these are some of the basic concepts where We've been stuck over here. Even this so-called green revolution, it was way too uh, focused on productivity and calories, not on quality and nutrient density. And it was all on extractive de uh, design system, reductionist scarcity, which also Linda would mention as far as that's not good for your health. It's much better if you're living in rhythm with nature if you are living with an abundance mindset, which is what regenerative is. Are you improving the soil or are you degenerating the soil? And as we're finding out, uh, I'm happy to hear so many diving into the compost. If you have dust, adding compost layers to it will help you convert over to a healthy soil. And the key summary for regenerative is between conventional and regenerative is whether or not you are treating all soil as a living organism that constantly needs to be fed carbon and um, via living plant roots. And yes, it's wonderful that uh, General Mills and some other big companies are diving into this, but again, um, so that they're not going to be competing with nature. They're going to be helping with diversity and um, holistic way of approaching it and reducing their chemicals. But it, the best is still local. It's, it's still too much traveling for some of the food and you don't have the best plants for um, your, your location. And these are the, on the, the first concept they've had, they've, it's interesting, they had to add this first concept because it, it, so many farmers were, or, and landscapers were just trying to copy what was being done across the, the country. So this really helps understand, understand the context of your, where you're located. So reduce the uh, soil disturbance um, and reduce which includes reduced chemicals and also re reduces the whole aeration process. Because if you, ha if you have healthy soils, simple things like having more earthworms, not the jumping worms, but the earthworms, that's the best way to have air in your soil. And also the much, much deeper roots help with creating more aeration. Um, I don't know if Woody is on today because he was talking to me a couple of days ago about uh, try getting an ordinance in the town of Winchester against leaf blowing. So you have this whole thing about minimizing soil disturbance. Is that possible that you can actually have an, a town make us? Yeah, a I, actually, oh, I don't have it handy, but across the country, 
they've had um, different states have been able to have it and different locations. Uh, there's about five or six um, towns in Massachusetts that were able to have that done. Um, Thank you. Sure. And the key thing is maintain living root um, year round. Ray Archuleta and uh, Gabe Brown are the top farmers and they say they fly across the country and it's just so sad to see how the old fashioned way where you used to literally used to think that a plant would suck all the nutrients out instead of, instead of as we know, the big exchange that we discussed where this is one uh, a really new process that they really didn't fully understand what was happening. It's just incredible network where the photosynthesis and the liquid carbon feeds the microorganisms in the soil and then the, the microorganisms come back and feed the uh, roots. So it's a symb uh, symbiotic relationship. And remember the deep dive we had on the rhizosphere where if you have incredible root structure uh, and the microbiology is um, very important to make sure that's nurtured uh, so that uh, there's growth, respiration, and again, the nutrient exchange. And I was just actually on a uh, Rooted in, in Health conference last last week on uh, for regenerative and there there's this new term or more popular term called quorum sensing where again it's just they're they're it's so exciting that they're finally focusing on we need to make the food more nutrient dense and we need to focus on that and also the high water holding capacity of the soil is so important to reduce the droughts and the floods. And that's a big, that's one of the biggest problems out in the West. California is, I mean, I traveled out there after I was learning this and I was blown away with um, how much uh, in the conventional area that the, the soil is still not covered. And again, uh, the water cycles, this is a new way to describe it that really helps um, focus on recreating your local ecosystems and your local, the native, or even you know the best of the best in order to get back to the small water cycles, which again is another key thing to reduce droughts and floods. And as we've mentioned, mycorrhizal um, fungi is extremely important and they didn't it's you can't really see that with the human eye they it's something that they they've discovered because they, they were too often looking at degenerative soil and their number of scientists literally woke up and said let's go really dive into the soil that's really working and figure out what's really working and again here is the infamous uh, compost poster and one of my favorite sayings in here is that compost converts nitrogen into a more stable and less mobile form and phosphorus into a less soluble form. So instead of just throwing nitrogen and phosphorus on unhealthy soil, you don't even, if you plant legumes and have it much more biodiversity, you don't even need to um, add more nitrogen and phosphorus once your soils are healthy. And again, um, I forget if I recommended this film, 30 minute film from John D. Liu, who is going around the world and literally restoring ecosystems. He was hired by Paradise, California to restore their, their horrifically degraded lands after the wildfires. And a key thing that they're realizing is trees use the under underground um, fungi networks to exchange nutrients and help neighboring plants. And look forward to Suzanne Simard. I'm so excited her book is a New York Times bestseller and there's going to be a movie made 
um, by Amy Adams in the next few years. That'll really, really help, I think. And again, focus on local. If you don't have a backyard, go find a vacant lot and try to help convert it over. And here are some of my favorite sayings that I've come across over the last three years. And I love the first one. The real efficiency is biology. So these huge machines that are trying to you know, oversimplify and it's like, no, if you dive into the beautiful complexity of it and you work with it, you will be much healthier and much more profitable. And Dr. Christine Jones is one of the top doctors, I mean, uh, soil scientists. And I love this. I've never seen a nitrogen deficient plant in a natural ecosystem. Obviously, there's something we're doing in agriculture that's interfering with the biological fixation of nitrogen. And Charles Massey is another one, an ecological approach of farming that enables landscapes to renew themselves. Not having to pay all this money to throw more stuff, it does it itself. And this is the other really key thing. It's not drought that causes bare ground, it's bare ground that causes droughts. And this is another real key thing, like I've mentioned, I've heard so many excited soil scientists and professors. The discovery that plants actively cultivate and then extract nutrients from symbiotic microbes is new. It's like years ago, we knew about the whole probiotics thing for our guts, but we weren't making the connection. So to simplify, we've been working on degenerative. It's awesome that we put the brakes on for sustainable, but it's excellent that the UN is into ecosystem restoration, which is another way to describe regenerative. And then there's many, kiss the ground reviews, many different ways that we can do it. It's tons of you know, biochar you've heard of, tree intercropping, composting, of course, right smack in the middle. And definitely a plant rich diet, but it's also, um, proper grazing, silvopasture, so, um, and proper grazing, not overgrazing or undergrazing, literally right smack in the middle, so it's healthiest for uh, the cows or whatever the livestock is. So transition or reminder of this, this wonderful poster of, yes, we get it in regards to the unhealthy gut and the healthy gut, uh, but it's the same thing for the healthy ecosystem. And the key here is um, microbes rule this world. That's the key part of healthy soil, which equals um, healthy soil micro microbiome equals healthy plants and animals and insects, of course, healthy human, which equals healthy planet. So that's a transition into Linda. Great. You can even leave it on this slide. I don't have slides, but everything everything in your slide supports everything I have to say. And that's part of the beauty of it, I think. So I'll be, um, maybe I'll be a little extra quick. I know our timing is such that um, this is kind of an intro to future um, Grow Local sessions. So I'll just make some of the connections and we can maybe uh, invite the discussion another time. I'll let you guys do that. But um, when I, sort of when I think about um, this idea that the, that the body, the nature, everything has an innate ability to heal itself if we would just get out of the way. There's a sense when, when I see this slide about how microbes rule the world, the microbes will be here after we're long gone, right? They've been here a very long time. They're giving us a chance, see what we do with it. Um, but the, uh, so transitioning into this food piece, the focus of agriculture over the last 50, 60, 70 years has been the production of abundant calories. Was a, it was by design. There was a real push to see if we could get um, uh, this sense of feeding the masses, but we didn't really understand what feeding was and we didn't go back to some of the indigenous uh, knowledge that uh, Fred mentioned and we really got off track. So what ended up happening was that starchy calories um, were what was identified as the goal and it wasn't necessarily nutrient rich. So all these comments again in Carol's slide as well about nutrient 
density as a priority is just foreign to what's being done in our agricultural industri industrial agriculture. So industrial food, whether for animal feed or direct human consumption is selected not for quality or flavor. By the way, quality and flavor do go hand in hand, which is kind of nice for those who want to go that route. It's a real big payoff. Um, but the goal is yield volume, calories, particularly high starch, stability of transport, right? The tomatoes that are, have to be trucked someplace, they want them to not end up bruised. That has nothing to do with nutrient density um, or quality. Uh, shelf stability, how long they'll last once they get to the place of, uh, of selling. Uniform size and color, and ultimately uh, profit. So the nutritional quality doesn't factor in. Ecosystems are systematically destroyed, again, as we've been hearing. Humans are chronically ill as a part of that whole system. Soil is turning to dirt and arable land is becoming desert. I heard a, um, a statistic that just blew my mind over the last 10,000 years, 40% of the earth's uh, surface has been um, decertified, so made into desert. Uh, by our industrial agriculture. Now, that's just an enormous number, 40%. And uh, if we turn all of this on its head and designed a system that works, it just might look like what nature intended in the first place to Fred's comment about the indigenous um, goals. So uh, another thing that I came across that I really liked was the Oxford Dictionary defines nature as things that are, uh, the first item, as things that are not human or things that or, and excluding also things that humans touch. You know, it was like, okay, sorry guys, we kind of blew it. And so a lot of this goal, again, Grow Local, is to insert ourselves back where we belong in our place in this complex um, ecosystem. So, um, you know, aiming for the uh, nutrient density is really what it's sort of all about. So I came across a nice quote from uh, an uh, Sir Albert Howard, an English botanist who wrote The Soil and Health, The Study of Organic Agriculture. He was sort of the father of some of the organic principles he wrote back in 1947. Um, and his quote is, the whole problem of health in soil, animal, plant, and human is one great subject. And he didn't have the research of the science and all of that stuff that we have now to kind of prove his point. But I think that uh, catching up with him is also a nice idea. And he came at that point. Um, there's a lovely quote, we can get into it in more depth at another time. So uh, uh, when I started with the Grow Local, I understood the importance of eating a plant-based, that doesn't necessarily mean only plants, but certainly mostly plants diet. And uh, I've, as I've said before, I intended to start all of this with just a garden, right? Rows and rows of vegetables. That's what I thought I was getting into and things have changed enormously. I also had been informed about the concept of organic. And since we started, that has really uh, spread to include much, many more nuances as has this whole uh, process been. So you can plant an organic garden with a focus on avoiding toxins, right? You can, uh, you can leave out industrial fertilizers, you can leave out the pesticides. And in that sense, and I'm not saying that's not important, right? The glyphosate example has just been I hope explained really well here, but um, the toxins being out doesn't mean the nutrients are in. And that was just, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, but I thought organic meant, and it's not really what organic, it's the spirit of what organic meant to mean. But of course, in our capitalist society, that people will take the opportunity to, you know, take that little advantage anywhere they can. And so things like the, um, you know, the hydroponic blueberries, maybe don't use the pesticides or insecticides, but they also aren't doing the microbiome and the soil. So they get a chance to say we're organic because there hasn't been clarity around what organic means. Fred and I did a um, training around real, the real organic project, and it really was very convincing that we need the whole microbiome. And of course, that's been very clear from Carol's work too. So, um, trying to think about how we get, um, so the original intention behind organic includes honoring the intricate extensive microbiome, the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live in soil and help to distinguish soil from dirt. Um, 
I've also learned that the microbiome serves this other huge function, which is that it's part of how the, the microbes are part of how the nutrients get from the soil to the plant. And of course, Carol has itemized that too in some of the, even in some of the slides she showed. The Real Food Campaign by Dan Kittrich is one that has uh, taught me an awful lot about that. And, and it just fits everything Preseda was saying as well, which I just love. And that is that there's this match between um, the, the plants and the insects that will eat them. You know, there they're, are uh, these matched sets. So as Dan Kittritz explains it, you could have a, a bale of hay that humans will walk in and want to sit down on as a chair, but a cow, a cow might walk in and want to eat because it has the digestive system to be able to take it on. And humans don't have that digestive system, so we don't see uh, hay as a food. Similarly, and the details for another time, but similarly, there are insects that will look at a healthy plant and say, I don't, that's got too many polyphenols. I don't have the ability to digest that and turn away. And therefore you don't need as many of the fungicides, herbicides, um, pesticides, if the plant itself is healthy. So organic doesn't get you there. Um, and so the, one of the things that Dan Kittritz found was that his organic farm was kind of sickly, um, better than other things, but he started looking for how to make the, it actually nutrient dense. And once the microbiome is there for the plant, it can solubilize the nutrients. Even if there's nutrients in the soil, it won't make it to the plant without this rich microbiome. Then the plant gets to put together these very intricate models, um, molecules, um, polyphenols, again, for another time, the details. And once it has these rich, healthy polyphenols, that's the plant's healthcare system. So the plant in its health naturally will um, uh, protect itself from um, these invading uh, organisms. So it makes the plant more uh, um, resilient and can resist disease. And now I bring it to the human part, which was really supposed to be the topic of my conversation, but the, the uniformity of the cycle is so important. When we eat the polyphenols with their intricate molecular structure, and it's incredible number of uh, 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 incredi incredibly complicated molecules, these naturally protect us also from disease. So it's these polyphenols that we eat with nutrient optimized, in nutrient optimized vegetables that contribute to our innate healthcare system and that assists us in being more resilient and resistant to illness. Um, so our microbiome is helping us digest our food. And this great quote, I don't have it specifically here, but it sort of says like, we don't digest our food. What were we thinking? Our microbes digest our food the same way that the nutrients are digested um, in the plants. And so um, the very same compounds that bring this Poly, the same polyphenol compounds that bring this healthcare system to our bodies literally are the nutrient dense and taste components of the plant. So a two-year-old that tastes a carrot of low quality, low nutrient density um, may not find it tasty in the same way that they might fight over Another one, that's their, their innate ability. They didn't learn that from somebody else. And I think it's just really fun and a super game changer to be tuned into the fact that we are not so different as those things in the wild um, if we get it right. So my challenge is how do I even pick the plants? And I suppose if I'd start early and went to right, right lock farm, I could have done it, but I'm coming into it a little bit later to get all of those pieces in place as I'm picking my plants and honoring the microbiome and taking it further. I think that there's one element of the genetics to get it figured out. There are other pieces to the puzzle. And, um, you know, right, right now I've got a couple of beds that don't even have their good soil in them yet. Um, so I offer that as an intro more for another time, but open to some comments or wind it up and talk later. Somebody else can decide. 
we have a couple of minutes if anybody has pressing questions. All right. Uh, at, the, at the same time, Margo has put into the chat all the links to um, um, our YouTube channel and uh, access okay. to um, uh, our previous episodes. Oh, great. Thank you, Margo. I guess the question is, are people having problems going on the website? After, if anyone does, maybe we could do that after the discussion that Linda had. Well, Linda, do you have to register to get in the website? No, you just have to be, if you want to be in the forum, uh, then you have to register, but you can look at anything on the website except for the forum publicly. You don't have to be a member. Now for the Facebook, yeah, you have to be a become a member. Uh, there's just a few questions. I don't know what I'm doing with those questions, the answers to those questions. I should give them to you, Fred. How's that? Um, and that's about it, about being ex inclusive, no, exclusive, I guess, exclusive. You had problems, Anne? Yeah, so I just typed, so I typed, I thought I registered. And then, well, now when I type in Grow Local, I come to the Winchester's Farmer's Market and then New Garden is starting up, but I can't find any information. Well, you have to do, I mean, if you want, I can, do you want me to do that now, Fred? No, we could do that. Do something else. I'll call you separately. Thank you. <laughs> but I could show you right now. Probably, if you don't mind, I, I can't save the chat. If you don't mind sending these links by email. I can right. I mean, the them. idea was if we're okay. recording, I could show you right now. Right. That's and that would be in Somebody the else could figure it out. Right. That might be would that be okay? Does that work, Fred, time-wise? Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? I have a question for Linda. Um, so Linda, um, th th I love the way you've started connecting everything to the microbes. You know, the only time I actually uh, had this uh, a reason to add microbes is this idea that Fred had spoken about, about soaking roots in this mycorrhiza, the fungus. The tea kind but, of thing. Sorry? I think Fred's talked also about being able to add a tea later if you didn't get it done in the first place. If you didn't get it done initially. Yeah. That's never spoken about, right? I mean, it's it's something we only add chemicals, we add nitrogen, phosphorus, um, but we never add, never think about adding the microbes. And, and do, do we have to add microbes? I know I did an experiment. So I when I, after Fred spoke to me, I took uh, I have zinnias, and I put two rows, one of them soaked with the mycorrhiza and one not. And Margo, walk over some time and I'll show you the difference in the size of the plants. Okay. It's just night and day. Can you bring those pictures another time for us? I will, I will. Yeah. I should I mean, take one thing away. is, I don't know if some people are part of Facebook, it'd be nice besides me, because everyone who becomes a member can post pictures of their gardens mm -hmm. and their yards. Definitely in the Facebook if you're part of Facebook. So it'd be nice to to see that, to see other people's garden. So Ivan, I know you're on Facebook. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, in fact, I, that's the reason I want to connect with uh, with 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 you know the Grow Local. So uh, so uh, so I can okay. sort of extend the network yeah. as well. So so to to speak to what uh, to Ivan's experiment. Um, and it also speaks to the whole no-till um, that, that uh, when you're planting um, in, tilled dirt, in tilled soil, uh, that's disrupting the, uh, the microbiome in the soil. Yeah. Adding um, the mycorrhizal fi fungi um, is a head start to recreating that network again. And it's a little experiment anyone can do. Just, you know, just take two plants, one with soaked and one not, and just, just do it. And just, boy, I'll, I'll get a photograph. That's a good idea, Linda. I didn't think of that. Yeah. 
Where do you get the mycorrhizal fungi? Is that? I got it on Amazon. I know the Fred asked me last time. Yeah, you can buy them anywhere, probably on Etsy, right? <laughs> yeah, so there, there are commercial projects, products now yep. um, that, that has a percentage of um, the fungi in the product. Or you can go to, um, Carol, uh, you know John Kemp? Um, he is a, a, an early, he's, he produces products for farmers, but uh, from the, from the um, fungi perspective. Hmm. So he, he produces at a, a large scale um, for, a, for hundreds of acres of product. But well, he does, he does uh, sell these like little five pound thingies. Yeah, I got this one here, Bigfoot. <laughs> Bigfoot, I love it, I love it. Well, and also, um, I want a t-shirt. Mahoney's has decent compost that it actually includes uh, the mycorrhizal. Oh, okay. yeah, they do, that's right. Well, and it, it makes me think also, so clearly the no-till is a big part of it. Um, of course, my um, yard having no ground cover for a month is a little bit funny because it feels like I'm making dirt, but in time, right? In time. Um, but when you think about the human body, every time we do antibiotics, it's as if we're tilling yep. and we just clean out, you know, and I understand that there's a need uh, in certain situations. And I certainly understand that it's been a huge breakthrough in medicine to be able to do that but typically they just clean out everything and you start over. And I see so many cases where the story, and this will blow some minds, I, others might know about this, but people who are born by C-section mm -hmm. end up getting the skin microbiome as they leave the body, mom's body, as opposed to the vaginal slime or whatever you want to call it. And that there are, it, it sets you up for a whole slew of, um, uh, illnesses that I now am watching people develop over time, you know, the chronic ear infections and more likely to get mono and more likely to get autoimmune diseases and on and on and on. And um, there are some kind of more informed um, uh, obstetricians who are taking vaginal slime and wiping it over the face of the newborn that's born by C-section. I mean, that is wild. I mean, it's also wonderful, but they're also learning. I don't know if people have heard about things like fecal transplant for some of these illnesses that can't turn around and for some things like autism, where they will actually take fe feces, put it in a little capsule so you can take it, but it's essentially just transplanting, you know, the microbiome and it's just wild. I mean, this stuff is going to catch up with us in a way that is transformative. So honor your microbiome, be, be wary of antibiotics don't use them where you don't need them and um let's see what we can do with this it's pretty exciting it changes that whole notion of eating shit eat shit yes you say thank you i will <laughs> oh it's so interesting right play in the garden you know play in we call it dirt but now i say soil um things like get a pet so that the you know that dog will bring in stuff from outside and 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 not be full of hand sanitizers. I mean, there's been this other element over the COVID stretch where we have this sense of afraid of every single thing as opposed to supporting our immune system that's, that's helpful. I just I mean, gotta, you know, I think there was Suzanne, a culture before that. You know, Suzanne Samar, the, the, the uh, finding Sorry. the mother tree. I was just saying. As, as a, yeah. a little girl, she, that's what she did. She ate the dirt. She was always fascinated by soil. Well, I mean, it's a beautiful concept, right? And then when you also think about how the nutrients, the water cycle piece, which is so important and how that can then kind of be superimposed on the body. The, um, I often teach that the minerals um, are kind of like name tags. You go to a big conference and you're in the you know, conference waiting area, you don't know what room you're supposed to go to, you're, you look at your name tag and it says, you know, 207, you go up to 207. That in a way, these minerals are telling the water where to go in your body. And different minerals will help pull the water intracellular, other ones in between the cells interstitially, other ones will help keep it in the, um, in your vessels. And that if you are really um, 
uh, you know, mineral poor, you'll drink water and it'll just dilute your body further that we need those minerals. And so I usually recommend things like Himalayan rock salt or something. We need these minerals. We need them. It's part of this ecosystem that helps the whole body work in terms of us staying hydrated. A lot of, of arthritis is dehydrated joints and sponges dehydrate don't give very much, right? So a lot of people don't make the connection between dehydration and arthritis, but it's a significant one. There's books about it. So I just love these water cycle things. Like it's literally happening. So preview of coming attractions. So uh, if people want to stick around and Margot can show us. I think I have to leave. Uh, we haven't eaten dinner, so. Yeah, I know, it's getting, it is getting long. <laughs> I can I mean, see we, the boys and the boys and Sheila hovering over the background, so. If you want, what I can do is um, do it on my own and put it up, I don't know, on YouTube or something. Or if people want to stay, I will, I will do it. I'm here. Or, or can you access the chat? Other people? I can't access the chat, so I'm just wondering oh. why. Why? I mean, I can access the chat, but I can't save it. And yeah, that's maybe because go, I'm using. Uh, so no, it's because I'm using the iPad, so the iPad oh, doesn't have um, yet. So there's yeah. you don't see the little three button thing. No, no, no. Three. Actually, you give me an idea. I'll use my phone. I can do it on my phone. Yeah. Uh, Sandy, you're on mute. I I would just recommend Margot doing uh, I think uh, on, on YouTube. Or something. Yeah, I mean I can uh, I can I do have uh, Zoom on my own for other reason for other stuff. Uh -huh. So what I could do is just do how how to connect with Grow Local. Yeah, right. Because then other people have access to it, not just those of yeah, us. And so, in, but they would have to be able to get to it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> we'll get there. Everybody can get to YouTube. Who, if you get who's on first? <laughs> what is that joke? Yeah, it's sort of like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good All night. Right. I should go too, but I'll catch up with all of you. Yeah, thank you. And and, and if you want, you can just call me and okay. I can go over. That's good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Wonderful you discussion. Thank Great you. Great discussion. Excellent. Good. Yep.